know this is the New Testament now. If you'd like a paper, there's paper right here. Anyone, uh, Brother Phillips, if you'd help us here, just go ahead and take those. And anybody that needs a uh, handout as they come in. Good evening, everyone. It's uh, good to be here with you tonight. My name is Wendell Maynard, and I'm the senior pastor at Firstborn Ministries, and we're glad that uh, you are able to be with us tonight to be able to listen to this Bible study. This is the seventh lesson in a series that we're calling Search for Truth, and so tonight we begin learning from the New Testament. Let's bow our heads and let's pray and ask God to be with us tonight. Father, as we come to you tonight, we thank you for the Word of God. We thank you for you said that your Word we can hide in our hearts and it enables us not to sin against you. I pray now, God, that you would open our hearts as we open the word of God tonight. Give us insight, direction, and guidance. And for that, we will praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tonight we begin learning from the New Testament. Uh, the New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Everything typified in the Old Testament or foreshadowed in the Old Testament, it is revealed in the New Someone once said that the Old Testament is the will of God concealed, while the New Testament is the will of God revealed. The Old Testament provides a backdrop for the New. The Old Testament was that of expectation and longing, looking for the Messiah, while the New Testament was that of fulfillment of that expectation and those longings within the hearts of people as they were met in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. John chapter 1, we begin tonight with our scripture text in verse 43. The day, following Jesus would, the day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip, uh, who was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And he findeth, uh, Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets have written. And he is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Again, in the New Testament book of 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 10, the Bible says, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace of God that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow." unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us did they minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost set down from heaven, which things do angels desire to look into. What this passage teaches us is that there was an Old Testament longing and searching for the Messiah. And the Old Testament people, they prophesied the coming of this Messiah. This Messiah would take away the sins of all the world. They looked, they searched to know when Christ would come on the scene. And they spoke of his suffering and the glory that would come into the hearts of men and women when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they spoke of a time uh, that they looked ahead in time. Their time was not of themselves, but they spoke of a time whenever Simon Peter would live. And even into our days, they preached that which the Lord would do for another day in the future. This thing was so good that the Bible says that the angels desire to look into it. If you've been saved, and you have re then you have received something that the angels cannot receive. They desire to look into it, but they cannot. The New Testament is divided into five different sections. First of all, you have the history gospels. They are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then you have uh, the book of Acts, which is a history book of the first 30 years of the church. It tells the birth of the church, and then it tells all of the things that happened within that first 30 years of the church of that time. The book of Acts is as fundamentally important to us as the book of Genesis is. You see, the book of Acts is important to us in regards to the church and how the church should be set up and what the church should believe. 
because that was where the church began. That was the beginning of the church and is a, is a history book of the first 30 years of the church. If we want to know something about creation, then we go back and we look in the book of Genesis because it is in Genesis that we find in the beginning God created. And so it stands to reason that if you want to know something about the church, how the church began, what the church believed, and the things that the church stood for, then you would go to the book of Acts because that was the beginning in the first 30 years of the church uh, that, that was there in that book. And then you have the Pauline epistles, and an epistle is just nothing more than a letter. It's an old English word which means letter. And Pauline, this was because Paul was the writer of the book uh, uh, of these uh, books that are there. And so they're called the Pauline or letters that were written by the Apostle Paul. Then you have the general letters or the general epistles. And all of these books are teaching books, instructing about life and also correcting problems that they had within the church of that day. The apostles, the writers, uh, they set their pen to be able to write answers to the problems of that day. And finally, you have a book of prophecy. And that is the book of Revelation, or the book of end things. The book of Revelation is a book that deals with past, present, and future as well. This book is very picturesque in its language, and it describes beasts, and it describes uh, um, battles that would go on. It talks about the mark of the beast, and, and there's a brief description of heaven, and also a brief description of hell that is there in that book also. Also, you will find the devil's last stand in the book of Revelation. You will find his ultimate uh, defeat will be that God will defeat him and he will be cast alive into the lake of fire where he will be tormented forever and ever and ever. That will be the end of the devil. There are a total of 27 books in the New Testament and they're written by eight different people. The New Testament was written over a period of about 100 years. And so an easy way to remember how many books there are in the New Testament, there are 27 books in the New Testament. If you would take the three, which is, uh, or take New, which has three letters in it, and Testament, which has nine letters in it, and if you know multiplication, you can take three times nine, and three times nine is 27. That gives you the number of books that are there in the New Testament. If you remember back in one of our previous lessons, it is much the same way that we can remember how many books are in the Old Testament. There are three letters in Old, and there are nine letters in Testament. And when you put the three next to the nine, then you have the number of books that are in the Old Testament, and that being 39. As we look into the New Testament, one of the first individuals that we are introduced to is John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a very colorful character. He was an individual that probably would not be welcome at many of our churches today. He was a straight shooting, uh, rough and rugged individual that said it like it was. John was called a Baptist, not because of his denomination that he was a part of. Somebody told me one time that John was a Baptist. I said, no, John was not a Baptist. John was the Baptist. <laughs> and the reason why they called him John the Baptist is because he believed in immersion by, in baptism by immersion. He practiced baptism by immersion as well. John's birth was one that was very miraculous, and it was one that was a, uh, it was a promise to uh, his mom and dad. His father, Zacharias, who was a priest in the temple, and his mother, Elizabeth, they were well on in years. They were, old, uh, they were older uh, folks. The Bible says it this way. They were stricken in years, which means that they were past the age of childbearing. And yet, one day, Zacharias who had gone into the temple to be able to offer prayers and incense on that particular day, the angel of God came to visit Zacharias in that time. And when he did so, he told him that his wife and he would have a child. Zacharias was taken back at this because they had been married for several years. And as I said, they were very old at this time. And so he was like, well, okay, if that's what you say. And so as a sign that this would happen, he would remain unable to speak for the duration of his wife, Elizabeth's pregnancy. He was speechless, you might say, at the, at the news that he had received that he and his wife were going to be parents after all of these years. John, 
he was the, uh, or, or rather, uh, Zechariah, he was only able to speak after his son John was born, and whenever he announced that his name shall be called John. And so John, he would be raised by his mom and dad up until the point where he would leave home, and God would use him tremendously in order to introduce the Lord Jesus Christ. The whole job and purpose of John was to introduce and to prepare the way for the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting also that John was the second cousin of Jesus Christ, and he would, be, he would perform, as I said, a pivotal role in preparing the way for Jesus Christ and preparing a platform for him to be able to stand on and to introduce him to the world that he would preach to. Many prophecies in the Old Testament talk about John the Baptist, and these were prophesied 700, some of them uh, more, 700 or more years before John actually came on the scene. One of them is in Isaiah. It says this in Isaiah 40 and 3, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, and make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And then again, in the book of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, the, the prophet Malachi, he prophesied of John the Baptist and said this, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. John was the one that they spoke of. John has been referred to as the forerunner of Jesus Christ preparing the platform on which Jesus Christ would minister to the people of his day. In the book of Mark chapter 1, uh, it says this, And as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I will send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Again, speaking of John. And then it echoes the words of Isaiah and Malachi by telling us that he is the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord and make his path straight. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem, and they were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. Again, this is why John was called John the Baptist, because he baptized people. He, he, he baptized them uh, unto repentance, the word of God says. He believed in water baptism by immersion after people confessed their sins. And then it tells us something about John's character and, and his clothing. John, uh, the book of Mark chapter 1 and verse 6 says, And John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There comes one mightier than I after me, the shoelaces of whom I am not worthy to stoop down and to untie. And he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. So this is what John preached. John preached the baptism of repentance. He preached, repent, because the kingdom of God is at hand. He preached that you must turn from your sins. John also preached the importance of water baptism. He said, you must and you need to be baptized. You need to and you must be baptized in water. And John also preached about the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, that the Holy Ghost was going to be poured out. Now, John was a very... Um, Roughshod man. He was a guy that pulled no punches. He called it the way that he saw it. And uh, I don't think that he probably would have been able to write the book on how to make people feel comfortable in a church service. <laughs> he probably was not the guy that would do that. He, you might say he was the Jonathan Edwards of his day, preaching sinners in the hands of an angry God. That was John. I mean, it was like no nonsense, and he just said it the way that he saw it. But God had a purpose and a plan for him, and he fulfilled that plan that God called him to do. The Bible says that his garment, his coat was of camel's hair, and he ate wild honey and locusts as his daily diet. He must have looked a sight with his beard that was all unkempt and wild hair, and, and he probably, in my mind, he looked like the original Duck Dynasty and uh, uh, he probably would have fit right in with those guys. One thing was clear about John, though. He took his calling seriously, and he gave himself to the calling of God tirelessly. John was also a humble man who knew the art of submission, 
which is evidenced by his own words when he said, there's one mightier than I that comes after me whose shoelaces I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. So John, in humility, stepped back and he said, I am here to prepare the way for the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is the one that you need to look towards. The next page we deal with is uh, the, the, the one that introduces us to the birth and the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. John was born about six months before uh, Jesus Christ. John the Baptist and John, they grew up together. John the Baptist and Jesus, they grew up together. And no doubt they uh, spent time together, playing together, and, and hide and seek, and, and doing all kinds of things. Maybe I, I wonder if it ever occurred to John why Jesus was able to find him every single time. And then one day it just came to him, it's because he is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. This is God who has come in flesh. But now we are introduced to the birth and the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Old Testament spoke of the birth of Jesus Christ. It told us the exact place that Jesus Christ would be born. It says in the book of Micah 5 and 2, But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, uh, from of old, from everlasting. What is that saying? It's saying and is pinpointing the exact place that Jesus Christ would be born. He's going to come out of Bethlehem, that little city. What's interesting is the name Bethlehem, it means the house of bread. And Jesus Christ said when he was on this earth, he looked at those that, that were hungry and he said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. And so it is, uh, uh, Jesus Christ, it was fitting for him to be born in the house of bread so that he could bring a, a satisfaction to the hunger of all men and women that were here in this world at that time and that ever would be in the future. Isaiah 7 and 14, uh, Isaiah prophesied of the coming of the Lord, and he said, the Lord shall give you a sign. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. His birth was going to be a miraculous virgin birth. It was going to be something that never has happened before and never will happen again. In the book of Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18 through 25, it tells us about the birth of Christ, and I read, Now the birth of Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was engaged to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, he decided that he would put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And then he went on to say, in verse number 23, a virgin shall be of a child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And so it tells us this was a miraculous birth. This was not anything that was brought uh, by the actions of man. This was God who had caused that seed to be planted in that woman and caused that child, Jesus Christ, to be born. We understand that the angel said it was Emmanuel, which means God with us. This was more than just a human being. This was God who had come in man to be able to redeem mankind back unto himself. The Bible tells us that there were shepherds that came to where Jesus Christ was at there in the stable. And then later, some believe it was probably a year or so later, that there were wise men that, that saw signs that Christ had come and that Christ had arrived. They saw that in, in the stars. Matthew 2 records this. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. What this lets me believe is that these gentlemen, they, they, they were uh, stargazers, and they studied the heavens for signs and, and uh, for seasons and things of that nature to be able to get some insight. And so they saw a star that let them know that Messiah, Jesus Christ, was born. 
And so they begin to uh, have great joy in their heart. And when they were coming to the house, they came to the place where Jesus Christ was at. They saw the star where he was at. They came into the house where he was at. And the Bible says that they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and they worshiped him. And they brought gifts, treasures to him. And they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now the gold that they brought, it represented the deity of Jesus Christ, meaning that he is all God. He is all God and God alone. The frankincense, it is a, it is a, um, a spice that uh, is a bitter spice that whenever you uh, heat it up, it smells very, very fragrant but it is a bitter spice. And that frankincense, it, re it represented the suffering that Christ would do upon the cross. And yet his sufferings, after all of those sufferings were over, it would, cre it were over. It would create a sweet-smelling savor or a sweet presence in the hearts of every man or woman that would say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, the myrrh, it was an, it was an oil that, that uh, they would use for anointing. And that typified the oil of myrrh that they would use when they would anoint him at his burial. And so all of those gifts that were given, they typified something about the Lord Jesus Christ. The early life of Jesus Christ, we don't know a whole lot about. All we know is that he got lost one time when his parents took him to church when he was about 12 years of age. You can read about that in Luke chapter 2. You ever been lost when you went to a church? I can remember whenever I was younger, my mom and dad had four kids and they went to the church house and they got ready to leave and they got in the car and they were on their way home and they started counting the kids and lo and behold, one of them wasn't there. And so they went back only to find my brother asleep underneath one of the pews. They got him up and they carried him on home. Well, Jesus Christ was lost at the church also. The, his mom and dad ran off and left him and they were on their way back home. Listen to what the Bible says about that. And when he was 12 years old, Luke 2 and 42, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and they sought him among their kinsfolk and their acquaintance. Someone might say, how did they go a day's journey and not realize their 12-year-old son was not with them? Well, it was quite easy for that to happen. In those days, one possibility was that the men would travel in one caravan and the women would travel in another caravan and they would meet up together at the end of that day. And so Joseph thought that Jesus was with his mother, Mary, and Mary thought that Jesus was with his father, Joseph. And when they met up together, they realized that Jesus was no, nowhere to be found. And the Bible says that, um, that it came to pass that, uh, that, or that they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. And they began to look for him and look for him and look for them. They didn't find him the first day. They didn't find him the second day. They found him the third day. And it says, after three days, verse 46, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And notice what it says here in verse 47. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Why? This young boy of 12 years of age, how could he astound and mesmerize and, and, and astonish the, the doctors of the law with his understanding, with his answers? The only answer to that is that this was not a typical 12-year-old boy. This was God who had come in the flesh, again, for the sole purpose of redeeming and paying the penalty of sin for mankind and giving us a way to be able to have eternal life. The Bible says that when his parents found him there, they said these words. They saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said unto him, after the amazement wore off, the mama kicked in with her, and she said, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, your father and I have sought thee sorrowing. Why did you put us in this situation, is what they were doing. They were scolding. Can you imagine scolding Jesus? Amen. God Almighty. And yet Jesus, the Bible says that he took it, and he said, How is it that you have sought me? Don't you understand that I must be about my father's business? Even at 12 years old, he realized there was a purpose for his life and a plan that he must follow. 
And they understood not the saying which he spoke unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth. And there is a key right here. And was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And so though he was God in the flesh, he subjected himself to his parents until it was time for him to step on the scene and begin to begin his public ministry. That's something that all of us could learn, and that is the value of subjection to those that that God has placed in authority over us. Finally, when Jesus was 30 years of age, he began his ministry. His ministry started after he was baptized, and then he was led up into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, the Bible says. He went up there, and he was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And afterward, the Bible says that he was hungry. I guess so. I would be hungry after a day and a half. I'm hungry after breakfast sometimes. And so it shows you that Jesus was not only God, but he was also humanity as well. And in that time, the devil came up and tempted him. And you can find, uh, you can read there if you would like, and you can read the three temptations that the devil brought to him, and he overcame every single one of them. And after that, the Bible says that he came out of the wilderness in great power and in great authority, great authority he came out of that place. Now, Christ's earthly ministry began with the choosing of 12 disciples that would become the apostles Uh, that were there in the church. A disciple is a learner, and the apostles were the men that Jesus Christ would use to set up the church there um, uh, in the book of Acts. You'll find that. Now, these men, as I said, they would become foundational for the church that would be born on the day of Pentecost. Later, Paul would write about this, and he would say that we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So what he was doing is he was lending authority or giving authority to these men that he had handpicked and handchosen and saying, these are the men that I've chosen. Listen to what they say. Follow what they have uh, taught because I have spoken to them what they need to do. The ministry of Jesus Christ would last about three and a half years. And these men that he would gather around him, he would choose 12 of them And they would learn from him during those next three and a half years. He would invest himself into these men. And again, I believe that the lesson here is that the Lord wants us to find somebody to invest ourselves in. He wants us to be able to to, uh, find someone that we can teach, someone that we can minister to. And so the Bible said that he did this. The ministry of Jesus Christ, it was twofold in reaching people. First of all, He used his miracles to be able to reach men and women. When there were those that were sick, when there were those that that had difficulties, when there were those that that had demonic spirits and oppressions, he healed them, and that gave a platform for him to be again to be able to teach them the things that he would want them to know. And the second way that he reached people was in his teaching, miracles and teaching. His miracles included those in uh, in in the sphere of nature, where he would stand at the top of a ship and there'd be all kinds of uh, uh, lightning and thunders and the storm would be tossing the ship back and forth and, and the people would think that they were going to perish. And Jesus would step up and he would demonstrate his Godship and he would say, peace be still. And there was a peace that was there. His miracles also included healing of sickness and, and also raising from the dead. And finally, those that He demonstrated uh, his power over demon spirits of that day as well. The first miracle that Jesus Christ had was the miracle of turning the water to wine. The Bible says in John chapter 2 and 11 that there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And Jesus and his disciples and his mother was there. And the Bible says that the mother of Jesus came to him and said, They have no wine. And Jesus said, Woman, what have I have to do with thee? Uh, mine hour has not yet come. What he, was, what he was saying is, it's not time for me to step on the scene and to show uh, my power and my authority. But at the pleading and the bidding of his mama, he, he listened and he says, all right, go and fetch, fetch six water pots. Go get six water pots. And they brought those water pots filled with water 
And he says, now, begin to pour them out uh, and give them to the people that are here at the feast. The Bible says as they poured that water out, suddenly there was the miracle of changing the water into wine. And they brought it to the guests that were there. The Bible says that the governor of the feast was so impressed that he said these words. He said, every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. What was he saying? He was saying this, whenever you get ready to set a feast, they would bring all of the good things out first of all. Because once you're full, um, pretty soon food doesn't taste as good as it did. And whatever you're drinking does not taste nearly as good as it did once you're full. And so then after that takes place and you're full, then they bring the, the bad stuff out. So it doesn't matter. It's going to taste bad no matter what. And yet the governor of the feast says, you have saved the good wine until now. You've saved the best for the end. I wonder if the Lord was giving us some insight as to what he would do at the end of times. You see, at the beginning, the Lord poured out his spirit on the day of Pentecost, and it was a beautiful experience, and many people received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But I wonder if the Lord is saying here that I'm saving the best to the end of times. Just before I take my church out of here, I'm saving the best miracles. I'm saving the best the best. Uh, teaching. I'm saving the best experiences. I'm saving all of that for the end so that my church is going to go out not only well-fed and full and satisfied, but they're going to go out pleased and happy as well. The Bible says in verse 11, this was the beginning of miracles that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed on him. What this is saying is that this miracle, it was for the purpose of the disciples. They saw this and then they believed on him. They believed that he was, in fact, that Messiah. And then we are taught about the man who was uh, healed from the palsy. The Bible says in Mark chapter 2, beginning at verse number 1, it tells about a man that was sick of the palsy. And he was born of four. And in just a little while, I'll be teaching about this, so I won't go through and I won't, I won't read about all of that. But the Bible says that when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And this man, he rose up. Jesus was demonstrating, I have the power to heal. He still has the power to heal tonight. He is the God that is able to do everything and anything that I have need of in my life. The Bible says many times we don't see the miracles of God happen in our lives because we don't ask for them. James said it this way, we have not because we ask not. And so it's always been my uh, policy in my life that I'm going to ask for a miracle. I'm going to ask God to do something tremendous, super, fantastic. I'm going to ask for him to do that. If someone is in need of healing, I'm going to say, God, give us healing. Not just a little bit of healing. Give us a total healing that is there. And uh, I'm going to pray for that big miracle. Because I don't want to be guilty of not having because I have not asked. And so the Lord, again, demonstrated his power over sickness and diseases. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, by his stripes we are healed. It's because of the Lord Jesus Christ going to the cross that we have the privilege of being able to experience healing in our bodies, in our lives, amen, and in the, in the lives of those that we love as well. And then the Bible says that Jesus Christ he demonstrated his authority and his power by raising somebody from the dead. Can you imagine going to a funeral service and the funeral service, it stopped and all of a sudden the person that was dead, they get up out of that casket and folks, uh, the funeral's over then. One thing that I have done countless times, thousands of times that Jesus never did. I've done, I've done something that Jesus has never done. Amen. And I've done it not once, but I've done it at least over a thousand times. You know what that is? I've preached the funeral of somebody that has passed on. Now, Jesus went to be able to preach a funeral, 
But when Jesus got there, guess what? There was no more funeral. There was a resurrection that took place, and and, uh, then they went on. They had a party. What's interesting is the Bible says that Jesus came to this funeral in Luke chapter 7 and verse number 11, and when the Lord saw her, he, he saw a dead man carried out, and the, he was the only son of his mother. Now she was a widow, and um, she was alone. And so Jesus had compassion upon her. There were many people that were there with her at that funeral service. She, her husband died, and now her son, her only child, her only son died, and she's all alone. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. This is, this is what the Lord Jesus Christ is like. He is a God of compassion. He cares for you. He cares for your family. He cares for the things that you care about. The Bible says he had compassion on her, and he said, weep not. And then the Bible says that he came and he touched the beer. When I, every time I read this, I smile. And uh, there, was, there, I, there was one time I preached a message on when Jesus emptied the beer. And uh, it wasn't B-E-E-R, it was B-I-E-R. Beer is just another uh, word for a casket or a coffin. And so when Jesus came and touched the casket, they that bear that casket stood still. And he said unto the young man, I say unto thee, arise. And the Bible says that he that was dead, he sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of anybody being raised from the dead, but God still has the power to raise men and women from the dead. God still is able to do that. That's what we preach. That's what we believe. There is nothing too hard for our God. I remember uh, speaking to a funeral director one time, and he said, Wendell, he said, I remember uh, going to a uh, a, a house, and we were going to pick up a body. We are going to retrieve a body. And we had gotten there. The police officer and the fire personnel, they had worked upon this man for about 45 minutes with no response whatsoever. He said, when we got there, he said there was no response. He said the coroner had pronounced him dead. And he says, uh, we got our body bag out. And he says, we pulled the man out of the bed. We put him in the body bag, put him on the gurney. And he says, just as we were zipping that body bag up, he said, the guy's eyes opened up. And he said, what are you doing here? He knew both of me and he called him by name. He said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm not ready to go yet. And he said, what was so funny was that the man had a t-shirt on that said, I wake up only for the weekends. And he said it was Saturday evening whenever uh, they picked him up. But God Almighty still does raise from the dead. He is able to do, the Bible says, exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. And so believe him. Ask God and just then believe him and then leave the rest of it to the Lord. You say, well, what if God doesn't do it? Leave that to the Lord. You just ask him and then leave the results up to him and accept whatever that almighty God would do. The Bible says that Jesus Christ also, he demonstrated his ability to, uh, to be able to cast demon spirits out. There was a man... Uh, that he had no name. But in Mark chapter 5, he is introduced as only a man that ran throughout the tombs. He was a man that would not wear any clothes. He was a man that cut himself. He was a man that had superior strength. They would put chains on him, and he would break the chains in two. And uh, they couldn't bind him. They couldn't control him whatsoever. And so uh, the Bible says that Jesus came to where the man was at. And he stepped off of the boat that he was upon. And there he put his, uh, as he stepped on the shore, this man came running to where Jesus was at. And he began to cry out to him. And he was wanting, he he was worshiping him, the Bible says. And then all of a sudden, these demon spirits took over in this man. And they began to speak out through this man. And they said, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high? I adjure thee by God, don't torment me. The Bible says that Jesus said, uh, uh, because Jesus told him, come out of that man, you unclean spirit. What this lets us know is that people can be possessed by demon spirits. And these spirits can speak out through people that were there. No doubt there were, there, there were probably many things that led up to this possession of this man at that time. But then Jesus begins to ask these spirits that were in this man and said, what is your name? 
And he said, my name is Legion. And the name Legion, it means thousands, or it could, have, it could, it could be as much as a thousand or as many as 10,000 that were there. And he said, my name is Legion, for we are many. The Bible says that then they besought him that he would not send them out of the country. And they said, there are swine, there are pigs that are there. Let us go into these pigs. And so the Bible says Jesus sent them into the pigs. And the Bible said whenever he did that, the pigs that ran over the cliff where they were at into the sea, and they drowned in the sea. Jesus demonstrated his power over demon spirits. So what that lets me know is that nothing that has you or I bound can stand in the way of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we allow the Lord to have his way in our life, he can break the chains of addiction. He can break the chains of bondage. He can break the chains of of, of demonic influence in our life, and all it takes is just calling upon the name of the Lord and asking Him to help us just like this man did. You might find yourself uh, in the future in a place where you just feel all attacked by the enemy. But if you call upon the name of the Lord and you believe that that Lord Jesus Christ is able and willing to be able to help you, he will step to your side and he will command those spirits and command those things that are bothering you and fighting against you to be, to be, to be loosed from you and you will find a place of deliverance. And I close with this tonight. The Bible says in the book of Mark chapter 16 that Jesus gave a commission to his church, to the people that would follow him. And he told them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's what we are doing tonight. That's what we, God has called us to do, to be able to go and to tell men and women about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did upon the cross of Calvary. And he said, those that believe and are baptized shall be saved. What he's saying is that you've got to believe. If you're going to be saved, you've got to believe. You've got to believe. You can't be believing on just anything You've got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got to believe that he came to this earth and he died for your sins. And if you believe that, then the Bible says you must be baptized. Because the Bible goes on to say, Jesus from his own words, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. What that means is, is that you need to be baptized in order to be saved. Just as much as you need to believe in order to be saved, you need to be baptized in order to be saved as well. Because he goes on to say, he that believeth not shall be damned. There is a place of damnation, it's called hell. But there's a place of deliverance, it's called heaven. And the way that you get to the place called heaven is by saying yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. You may be listening to this tonight, and you may be saying, that's me, I need the Lord Jesus Christ. What do I need to do to be saved? The Bible's very clear. You must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. And then as you believe on him that he died and he rose again from the dead, then you must, be, you must repent of your sins. Ask God to forgive you of the sins that are there in your life. And then after you've done that, if you believe that he has forgiven you of those sins, then you must go and you must be baptized in water by immersion in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And if you've done that, and the Bible promises you something called the gift of the Holy Spirit. And Peter said it this way, the promise is unto you and to your children and to all those that are afar off. When the Holy Spirit comes into your life, you will experience speaking with another tongue as the Spirit of God gives you the ability to do so. This is what God wants to do in your heart, and he will do so. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I thank you again for the privilege to be able to share the Word of God tonight. I pray that we would embrace the Word. I pray that those that are listening to this, that they would say yes to your will and way. And I pray, God, that you would help each of us as believers to fulfill the Great Commission by going and preaching and teaching and ministering. For, Lord, as we do that... We know that there are others that will, that will have the opportunity to be saved. And Lord, it will be such a blessing not only to them, but it will be a blessing to us being a part of the salvation plan of God and bringing that to men and women that are here in this world. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for never giving up on us. Thank you for coming to this earth and dying for our sins. In Jesus' name we pray.